the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Please be seated. The subject today is the role that Mary of love plays deep within us. Most often when we hear the word marriage, we think of a union between two people, a union that we can observe from the outside. But that union comes from something that lies deeper within those two people, and that deeper force is present in everyone, whether they're married or not. Mary of love, the same love that leads a man and a woman to become more and more deeply wedded to each other, is at work in every one of us right now, striving to create and to order everything that we think and feel. This may seem like a very strange assertion. It's pretty clear in the writings that marriage is important, but it's not necessarily obvious that it's interconnected with everything else that we love. Doesn't marriage exist in its own sphere, its own bubble? And isn't that sphere separate from the spheres of the other things that we love? Like, say, our love for the job that we do, or a more general love for the neighbor. It's not hard to understand why we might think this way. Probably all of us sometimes want to put our marriages, or our thoughts about marriage, or our hopes about marriage away into a little box and keep it there. But that doesn't work. We can't actually separate ourselves from the sphere of marriage, or from the striving that married love produces in us. The best illustration of this is the family. Families consist of all kinds of different relationships. People in families are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, cousins, grandparents, and so on. But all of those relationships, those families, are created by marriage. All those relationships are born out of the relationship of a husband and wife. Or as the reading from Arcan Celeste put it, the origin of all blood relationships and family relationships is traced back to marriage. Sons and daughters come from marriages. Brothers and sisters are people who trace their origin back to the same marriage, or who are so close to each other that they may as well have come from the same marriage. And so the web of interconnectedness builds out and out. Each new generation is established through new marriages. Think of a photo that you've seen that was taken at a family reunion. That photo will show 10, maybe 20, maybe 50 people who are all bonded to each other, all interconnected. And all of that connectedness descends from one marriage, one marriage of two people, grandparents or great-grandparents who started the whole thing. And all of our thoughts and our loves are interconnected in exactly the same way. They're joined together by marriages, perpetuated by marriages, and they descend from a single marriage. As we heard in the reading, from the marriage of good and truth in heaven, all loves are descended which are such as the love of parents for their children, the love of brothers for one another, and the love of relatives on down in their order according to their degree of affinity. In another place we read that all things which exist with a truly rational, that is a regenerative person, all of the things that constitute his affections, and his perceptions, and his thoughts, are interconnected as blood relationships and relationships by marriage. And in yet another place, married love is the beginning from which all loves originate and branch out. 
So the families that we see around us are perfect correspondences of the ways that parts of our internal selves are ordered. Family as a whole is a good thing, but families can also incorporate bonds between two or more people who really don't get along. And the same thing can happen inside us. We family strife in our minds. And different families or different branches of the same family often stand for different values. And so too, there are webs of thought and feeling within us that are at odds with whole other webs. Our good loves are united in that they all come from the Lord, from the marriage of love and wisdom. But the writings talk about whole other families within us that are descended from a single false assumption as the Father. And one way of describing what we're here to do on this earth is to say that we're here to decide which family we belong to, which of the gatherings of thought and affection within us will we choose to go home to. If we choose to be a part of a heavenly family, we're choosing to be a part of something that descends from the love of marriage that the Lord has given us. But that still doesn't explain why married love, of all things, plays such a fundamental role within us. We heard in the second reading that the sphere of married love extending from the Lord is universal. In other words, it encompasses all the other spheres coming from the Lord under its umbrella. And that includes spheres of protection, of reformation and regeneration, innocence and peace. These are not trivial spheres. Regeneration, innocence, and peace are some of the most precious and the most important things in creation. So how is married love like a parent to these things? One way to answer that question would be to say that all of our loves are derived from the marriage of good and truth, and not so much from the married love that a husband wife share. After all, the reading did say that loves in heaven are descended from the marriage of good and truth. So we might say the marriage of good and truth is this profound abstract thing. So it makes sense that our loves could descend from that. But love between a husband and wife, that's, that's ordinary. That can go in a box by itself. It's not that far. But that answer creates a false distinction. Because the married love that a man and a woman feel makes them into real forms and reflections of the marriage of good and truth, that they receive that marriage from the Lord. We can't actually separate that abstract idea of joining good and truth together from the real things that are like a body for that joining. And that body is the desire that men and women feel to marry, to join themselves together. In order to really understand this, we need to unpack what's even meant by the marriage of good and truth. Probably a lot of us, when we hear that phrase, get this sort of dim idea of someone taking good and truth and smushing them together like an ingredient in a pot. But goodness just means what we love, what we desire, what we want. And truth is what we understand about the way to make that goodness real, the way to make it happen. So the marriage of good and truth is described as thinking what we will, unwilling what we think. It's joining together desire and understanding so that something can happen. So this marriage is fundamentally about creating. It's about bringing together the things in our minds that belong together so that something new can be made. And this is why married love holds such a fundamental place within us. 
This love is about making our mind whole so that it can produce something. The love between a married couple is an expression of that love. The love that a husband feels for his wife and the wife feels for her husband exists because truth belongs to good. The good belongs to truth. And together they make something. When a man and woman come together, they can literally produce new life. That fundamental impulse, the impulse to join together things that belong together, extends into all of us, whatever the state of our external marriage. We can work to join good and truth together if we're unmarried, if we're divorced, or if we're married to someone that we really don't feel close to. Because goodness and truth don't come from our married partner. They come from the Lord. Everything good and true is from the Lord. And he gives us these things, and He's designed our minds so that our first and deepest impulse is to join them together and use them. That desire is able to find a whole and a complete expression in a person's love for his or her married partner. But even without that outward expression, the inclination to marry or to join good things together is present within us as a parent all of the good loves that we experience. So what are the implications of this teaching? What does it actually say about how we should think and behave? One fairly clear implication is that our attitude towards marriage says more about us than we might think. The way that we treat marriage says more about us than we might think. We live in a world that often marginalizes marriage. Culturally, we understand that love is important, but how often do we, as a culture or as individuals, demonstrate that in practice what we value are the skills and the habits that lead to what we call success? How hard is it to imagine somebody saying, look, it's great that he loves his wife, but anybody can love his wife. It takes something special to make this company run. <clears throat> what would it look like if we were all willing to assert that a deep and a lasting marriage is never commonplace, never to be taken for granted, and that the people who make those marriages are perhaps the people who have moved the biggest mountains of any of us? On an even more practical level, what do our actions say about how important marriage is to us? For a lot of married couples, this boils down to how much of your time and energy are you willing to set aside for your marriage? We can't always have perfect control over our schedules, but whether or not we make time for something is often the bottom line about what's really valuable to us. And there's a host of other things that make a statement about how do we hold marriage? Do we make dirty jokes? Do we look at dirty pictures? It's easy to pass these things off as harmless, but they can be affecting our minds on a pretty fundamental level. And by the same token, if we do respect and honor marriage, and make that respect a part of our behavior, then that establishes a healthy pattern in us that runs deeper than we might think. Another implication of this teaching, the final one for today, maybe the most profound, is that if all of our loves are descended from marriage, then they must have something of the quality of marriage in them. This means that an understanding of what marriage is meant to be that is what the Lord means it to be, can help us to have a deeper and a clearer understanding of everything that's good and useful. Marriage, in a sense, is the basic unit of a pattern. And that pattern creates our minds and the whole of the Lord's kingdom. And if we look at His creation in those terms and 
watch, to see his handiwork, we can start to get it. Start to see the order and the pattern. And as far as our own lives are concerned, the same qualities and behaviors that would make a marriage work are likely to be the qualities that work best for us in all the areas of our lives. Patience, listening, integrity, forgiveness, gentleness, playfulness. These things can make marriages come alive and something that can bring life to marriage and bring life to everything in us. In their essence, marriages are about sharing, creating, and receiving life. A husband and a wife share their lives with each other. And the love that they have for each other in heaven is described as a desire to be one with the life of the other. Married love was designed to be the channel through which the Lord creates new human life. And that fundamental joining together of things that belong together, marriage of good and true, is what the Lord pours His life into in us. It's a blessing that starts deep within and unfolds throughout us as generation after generation of new loves. Every one of those loves is born out of striving and has that striving within it. Striving to take what the Lord gives and make something with it. Amen. Please rise.